I've been asked to give a presentation on uh, workplace relations with regards to the interaction with the workplace and how that might have implications for safety. This is a huge area. You can take a whole course on that alone rather than just one lecture. So I'm going to selectively focus in on the guts of the problem, in my opinion. The main problem is one of perception. So let me ask you, I've got a couple of words there. Um, the middle word you'll be unfamiliar with, for the most part. Anybody familiar with the middle word, affordances? Okay, some of you have taken another course perhaps, or you've become aware of it, that's great. I'm going to be focusing on that concept. In order to try and address the issue of safety, so hands up, give me some definitions or um, uh, relationships with the word safety or the concept of safety. What is safety? Anyone? Injury prevention. Prevention of injury, good. Anything else? How do we achieve safety? What are you saying? Protecting. Protecting. Protecting oneself. Or others. Or others. Protection. Exactly. Also that. So it, you're probably thinking in your own way what it refers to. I'm going to focus in on what is the origins of being safe. And we're going to see if that links back to some of your, fur, your, your past studies of cognition and thought and perception. Anthropometry is actually the origins of workplace understanding and analysis and ergonomics. Anthropometry is the measurement of the human being. Anthro, anthropocentric, anthropomorphizing. Anthro means human, anthropology, metry is this measurement. So this is Dempster's famous for the 1950s or so analysis of the human being in terms of average dimensions. These are probably inches. And you should be familiar with inches as well as centimeters because the rest of the world in a large part uses inches. The United States, North America. But centimeters is European and uh, Australasia. But uh, be familiar with inches. It will serve you well to become familiar. Look, you all know inches. You've all seen one of those. That's 30 centimeters, right? It's also 12 inches. So this is, that's your metric, that's your basic measuring stick for your mind when you see these numbers. So anthropometry is based on the average sizes of human beings and limb lengths. And ergonomics is, the, is how the workplace is designed in a way to fit the user. Right now you're, you fit your environment reasonably well. Your table is not too high or too low, your chair is it's fixed, but it's, it's an average height. It's not too bad. But it probably could be better. And uh, designers have used anthropometric data, these averages for furniture tools and so on. And nowadays, technology. Technology is the big workplace environment resource that we have got to worry about. So let's focus on some serious issues that concern human beings and other animals, such as getting around in the world and the shape of the world with regards to that. We're going to focus on some examples that psychologists have looked at in great detail to reveal some very profound things about our interactions with the world and how we can know how to interact. So the question is, what's the maximum height of a stair that you can step on? And how do you know that? Well, of course, from the very beginnings as a child, you you experiment and you learn. And here you see some different sized environments relative to the, to the human being. The growth changes the relationship. And you look at a picture like that. You see an elderly person going up some stairs. You ask yourself the question perhaps, is that a safe scenario? Is that safe? What about that situation of climbing the environment? Is that safe? This guy. He probably survived that. Probably Queenstown somewhere. But it's not just humans. This is a real phenomenon. This is the truth. 
predefining code something that maybe and if you click on that on your PDF you can go to the uh, YouTube video and these crazy features. Oh, on top of crash. Aren't they getting up there? I don't know. Watch the video, you'll learn. <laughs> so so look at this. You'd think that this branch would not allow climbing a pond, but not only does it allow climbing up, but it allows bouncing a pond without like breaking. So on now these animals, you know, they haven't studied this. They've seen how to do it. And they've learned the information around it. <laughs> so let's analyze this whole issue of climbing a stair. We've got the step up phase. Here it is. That's the step up phase and the pull up phase. Okay? Now I could see that I could do that. I didn't try that ever before. I've never been in this lecture theater before. But those are the two phases, and I could see in fact that I could climb up on that on that riser height. The riser height. There's two phases, and we've got to be able to see that, we've got to be able to perceive that. So what's the maximum stair height of any stair you can step on? What's the maximum height? This is going to be an experiment we're going to analyze. Does it afford stepping on? Does it allow stepping on? Here's this word, afford, to allow. And affordance, we'll see, are the properties of the world that allow you to act. So we can go a little simple analysis, just the upper leg length, the lower leg length, the total leg length relative to the riser height. And we see that when we measure people, that the ratio of the riser height to the leg length, R over L, R is the riser height, L is the total leg length, is about 9 tenths of your leg length. The maximum that one can climb up is about 9 tenths of your leg length. So, would anybody like to volunteer to measure their length and I'll predict their maximum height? Come on out, come on down. So the leg length is defined as, well, good question, not to your waist, but to about there. About there. Yeah. Can everybody see if you stand here? So about, stand sideways on to them, please. What's your name? Talia. Talia. I think about there, so about 80, about 82 or 83, 82 or 83. Can somebody calculate point here here times 82? Maybe it's on here, so maybe it's on mine. Ah, uh, you should come back, Talia. Oh. <laughs> point eight, eight times point eighty three, about nine tenths of that. It's going to be, you can tell, seventy three centimeters. So first, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Do you think that you can climb on that? Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> step step up on that. Okay, you could. So I bet you that's less than seventy. 3.04. You come down. So that's only 70. Well, that's 73. That is 73. But you could go higher than that. That's interesting. Wow. Could you, can you see if you could step on that? That's too Right. You want to just try. Try that anyway. See how close you get to it. And no, no way. And that's way much more. I'll tell you what that is. That's uh, I mean, that's 80. That's 90. That's 90. That's way more. There's no way, yeah. <laughs> so, we give you a book then. Okay, come on over here. <laughs> so, we may not, maybe we didn't measure her leg completely correctly. So, there's 77. Can you step on that? Yeah, I'm just Oh! There you go. That's the limit. 77. It's going to be half the size you get. <laughs> yeah, don't tell anybody. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, 77, well, so that was higher than my calculation. Maybe my measurement of her leg length was a bit underestimate. I should read up on exactly where the measurement was took. It might have been a little bit higher. 
But the interesting thing you should have noticed is Talia could see that she could not climb the notch. She'd never tried that before. She could see these things. So safety has a lot about seeing your limits. And then accidents happen when you extend beyond your limits. So this is the biomechanical number that has been shown all people roughly about 0 0.88 well, actually, quite accurately, by 28 or 9 tenths of the leg length is their maximum. So then comes the question, can you see that? So here's a psychology experiment. You're in the Department of Psychology. Psychologists worry about how do you see the safety opportunities and accidents that are about to happen? How do you see the maximum height that you can climb on? And so here's the experiment. Well, oh, sorry, I've got the wrong mode. Good. So can you perceive the maximum height of stair? Famous, famous experiment by a guy called Bill Warren in the United States, in Connecticut, East Coast, United States, in 84, long ago, looked at stair climbing as one of the first experiments that looked at these so-called affordance properties of the world, the opportunities for action that one can see, the affordances. We'll talk more about affordances in detail later. He showed large photographs, just like this, projected on a screen. So somebody like Tally would stand there, look at the picture, and make a judgment of yes or no, I can walk and climb up on that stair. Different stairs were projected, judgment of yes or no. Asked both short and tall people to make the judgments, both short and tall. Here's the data. Here's the graph that shows the percent that said that was climbable. So, for example, when the height in inches, so remember the 12 inches is 30 centimeters, uh, 24 inches is uh, 60 centimeters, so you can convert that to centimeters if you like. So we can see that when the height of the stair is small, nearly 100% of both short and tall people, big people, say yes, that they can climb it. But as the height gets bigger and bigger, Fewer and fewer people say yes. Percent climbable goes from 100 to 50, 40, 30, and then eventually to zero when the height is very big. And in psychologists, in psychology, we have something called the psychophysical threshold. In graphs like this, the 50% mark is like a threshold that we can say is uh, the, the, the tipping point between, or the critical point between yes, I can. No, I can't. It's like a threshold. Okay, it's like yes versus no. So uh, we can see that there's two different critical points or thresholds for both the short and tall people. The short people um, will, will perceive their maximum up around 26 inches, the tall people around 33, 34 inches. Two different dimensions in the world depending on the shape of the human. That's interesting, but it's not very clear because now we've got two different numbers. So perhaps we're not measuring the world in the right way. So here's the, the trick. You don't measure the world in extrinsic units, like in just the physicist's numbers. These are extrinsic numbers. These are arbitrary, you know, inches, centimeters, you know, uh, microns, kind of arbitrary numbers. Let's do what psychology is all about. Psychology is about relations between organisms and environments. The fundamental point of psychology I put to is relation, or relationship. Fundamental key concept in psychology is relations. So when we're using psychology to understand workplace interaction, we've got to look at relations. We've got two different numbers, two different critical heights, but look at this graph. When we take the ratio of the riser height to the leg length, and we look at the 50% line, we get 0.88 for both tall and short people. So this is a perception experiment, I remind you. This is not people looking at graphs, projected stair heights, and saying, no, too big. Yes, easy, no, yes. And it shows that people's perception 
is as good as the objective measurements when they test people. So people's perception is very accurate. That's the first big point. People's perception is extremely accurate and amazing that uh, we can see the world in such a relevant way. Now, instead of maximum stair height, we don't want to build a house with stairs this size, unless you really want to exercise a lot. What's the preferred height? See, the designers of the world come up with these average numbers from the anthropometric data and say, oh, we'll build a stair of that height. I don't know. Let's just try it. Is that a good idea? Well, let's do an experiment and ask what the preferred height. So Warren then asked what, what, what's the preferred height that people can comfortably maintain and walk up for a certain amount of time, like a long time, for an hour or two. It's like the Goldilocks problem. Big, small, or just right. Hot, cold, or just right. So we went to the hospitals in, uh, in the area within New York City and found an old stair mill in a hospital that was not being used. And the stair mill could have adjustable stairs on it. They could change the height. And we put people on that and test them biomechanically by measuring their oxygen consumption to see how much work they were doing by doing this all day right? for different stair heights. And here's the graphs for short and tall people. On the bottom is your riser height in inches again. So this is preferred height. So look, it, for short people it's about seven and a half, eight inches. That's about, there, there's seven inches. And for tall people it's about nine inches, it's about that. These are the preferred um, heights. Why are they preferred? Because look, he's measuring the, this quantity of calories per kilogram whatever it is, this is the oxygen consumption, the calorie burn. And you can see whenever the, the stair height is here, the energy use is minimum. When the stair height is here, for the short people, energy use is minimum. Okay, so these are best fit curves, some sort of polynomial curve fit, regression fit to the data. And so this is very interesting, it shows that that if the stair height is not optimal, people work too hard. They don't, they don't want to work hard. Part of safety is efficiency. If something isn't being done in an efficient way, accidents can happen because people get stressed out. People lose their focus of attention when they're stressed. So it's very important for a psychologist to use all of these multidisciplinary techniques available to him or her, such as exercise science, to, to try and understand the oh, dimensions of uh, being a psychological being. <laughs> Minimum energy use for short and tall people, but again, two numbers. So what's the trick I ask you? What are we going to do now to see whether these curves line up? Instead of this extrinsic dimension, we're going to create an intrinsic dimension. So what are we going to do? We're going to divide riser height by leg length. Instead of having two curves with optimal preferred heights of 7.8 inches and 9.5 inches, 20, 24 centimeters, we're going to do the trick and find that when we do the intrinsic scaling, scaling to the body, a ratio, look, don't be afraid by ratio. I mean, sometimes people hear mathematical concepts and go, oh, it makes me feel sick like I'm 10 years old again in maths class. A ratio is just one thing relative to another. Okay, so the stair height relative to the leg, stair height divided by the leg, the leg is bigger than the stair, it's going to be a number less than one. Okay, so one thing relative to the other gives you a fraction. And we've got a fraction of about 0.25, about a quarter. In fact, 0.26. They line up. So the optimal stair height is about quarter of your leg length. So tally is leg length, what did we say, 73? 80? What was it? 83. 82, but I think it's more like 85. So a quarter of 85, a uh, quarter of 84, what's that, 42? 21. 21, se 21 centimeters. Where's 21? 21 is, is there. There you go. Does that look good to you? 
That's your optimal. 21 centimeters. You can write it down and check it out with your friends. But anyway, all of you can check out your preferred height. A quarter, 0 0.26, 0 0.25, 0 0.26 of your leg length is biomechanically optimal. Is the world designed that way? No, it's not. It's not designed that way. Many times. Sometimes it's close to that, but sometimes it's far from that. Here's a psychologist coming in again with the experiment. Can that preferred height be perceived to be safe? You've got to be able to see whether something is climbable in a safe way. That's why they put handrails in case it's not safe for you. Here's the perception experiment. Here is now looking at, um, at the slides again and, and choosing uh, the riser height for short and tall people that is preferred. <coughs> and people, when they look at a small riser height, they actually don't prefer it. They say they don't choose it. It's less than 50%. See? Whenever you look at a small stair, you don't say, oh, that's going to be easy because it's small. People actually go, no, it's too small. <laughs> yeah, small stairs aren't preferred. They are weird to walk on. Small stairs are weird. That's right, and there'll be a slide on that in a second. <laughs> That's exactly right, because uh, they're weird. They feel weird. They feel biomechanically efficient, to say it in a boring way. I like your way of saying it, they feel weird. So when you do the trick, perception experiment, 0.25, just like 0.26 when you actually measure people. The preferred stair height is again perceived very accurately. Perception is amazing. Perception is the source of knowledge, not thought. Forget thought. We see the world in order to know it, primarily. We think we're all very fancy schmancy human beings. We think and so on. In the beginning was perception. Every animal perceives, every organism, every bacteria perceives in the sense that it detects its environment in order to know what there's other in different senses of know. Here is your weirdness slide. <laughs> Why are monument steps so difficult to walk on? Because they're inefficient. They're not safe. They lead to failure at beauty contests. <laughs> For a girl, they're still laughing. Things happen very quickly at beauty contests. <laughs> so monument steps are, are so are so built because they're pretty, because you almost don't see the division in the, in the gradient. It looks smooth. Smooth is nice. Marble is nicer than concrete. All right? But these guys feel really weird, I think. So affordances is the concept I want to introduce to you in a big way today, because affordances are defined as the real possibilities for action in the environment. And it's a concept introduced by a very famous psychologist called Jim Gibson. You might have come across him in, your, in some perception courses, perhaps with uh, uh, John Peroni, um, who looks at optic flow, and Sam Charlton, who look at optic flow. That's a concept from the famous James Gibson. And at the end of his lifetime, uh, before he died in 1979, for the last 10 years he was working on the proper definition of the world. Not in terms of lines and lengths and shapes and colors, but the definition relative to the organism. And he's a very sophisticated thinker, recognized as the most important perception psychologist of the 20th century, I kid you not, by most professionals. And his uh, philosophical conclusions were that the world consists of affordances, the opportunities for action, because there's no perception without action. You can't define perception without consequent action. And I'm glad to see you taking notes, but these will be available uh, later in, uh, on, on, online for you. But uh, absolutely, take notes on what you think is important. So back to affordances. They're the perceivable properties of the environment. This table affords stepping on. This table does not afford stepping on for me. It does for cat. It does for a cat where height is dependent upon other things just in the size of its, its leg. 
Um, this, this umbrella affords picking up and touching the roof. And I can see that. I haven't tried it, but I have an implicit awareness of the length of my arm. And I can perceive the tip of this. That's haptic perception. There's a whole beautiful study, uh, experimental program on haptic perception. How do you know the length of objects? For a moment of inertia, physics. So I can touch the roof without breaking something. So I can see the properties of the world without even testing, without trying it beforehand. There's interesting debates about learning and, and attunement to information. But uh, basically, we see the properties of the world, what actions they allow. And Warren did the first experimental study of affords with the stair climbing stuff. Show that affords the physical properties of the environment in relation to it, not just in the head, in relation to us. So these, these are not just ideas. Affordances are a new kind of scientific concept for psychology, relatively new, the last 30 years, because they focus on the ecology of the situation. Big word, big concept, ecology, but a fundamental concept in today's scientific understanding. Ecology is about relation. And there's no understanding I put to you anymore in the world unless you take into account relations. Scientific tradition of just focusing on atoms and so forth, the atomistic materialistic view of just looking at the parts, doesn't work anymore. Brain science is not going to work by just looking at patterns in the brain. Believe me, I tried it. You don't get very far because you don't know what they're in relation to without carefully designed experiments. So, this concept of ecology is very important. And Gibson's last book was called The Ecological Approach to Perception actually, an ecological approach to visual perception. And I, I put to you that you should check it out in the library, open it anywhere at any chapter, and you'll be amazed at his insights, which are still being investigated to this day. But his concept of board is very important for workplace design. And uh, ergonomics designers all know about affordances, as you'll see um, when we get to it. So we show that affordances are not just physical, they're relational. This climbability concept, the crucial experiments on, sorry, this crucial experimental move to study boards was scaling the environment, scale the environment, not just use the extrinsic scale, but make the environment relative to the body. This leads to a modern concept now you hear thrown around called embodiment. People now talk about embodiment in psychology. You need to do this studies about embodiment. Our ideas are not just floating in the air, as the philosophers such as Bishop Barclay 500 years ago, or even Descartes might have thought, floating in the head somewhere, or floating even in the world. Ideas need to be embodied. Thoughts need to be in the body, in an environment. Not just the body floating in the air, a body grounded in an environment. So it's a, it's a fundamental concept. It's embodiment. Affordances are defined reciprocally. And uh, they record environment and perceiver, but they're considered real. These affordances are not thoughts. These are real properties of the relation. So if they're real, and if information is available to be detected, then the affordances can be directly perceived. Minimal thought, minimal thinking. Minimal cognition in the sense of having to think about things. Minimal hypothesizing what the world consists of. You just step up to the plate and do it. So this is the theory of direct perception. It's, as all good theories are, um, vigorously contested and investigated and, and it's controversial because it goes against a 500 year tradition of Cartesian dualism. The mind body problem. The mind body problem briefly says that you've got a mind separate from a body. Uh -huh. That has never been solved and never will be. It's a conundrum that has no solution because it's a purely formulated hypothesis. But it is the tradition within the majority of psychology. The mind body problem. It says the mind is in the head, 
in the brain, implemented on the brain, using Turing machine logic. And the brain is like, and the brain is like hardware, and the mind is like software. That's the current assumption, isn't it? That's what you, you've studied. And in many ways, it's an interesting hypothesis that psychology has taken seriously since the development of computers, especially. But it has not addressed the problem of how those thoughts get in contact with the world. How do you even know there's a world out there? You know, these are silly arguments like solipsism, that the world's in your head and you can never know the outside. So Gibson rejected that. He was a philosophy professor as well as a psychologist. He worked for the United States Air Force, training Air Force pilots, helped them to understand landing planes. So he, he looked at the reality of data for training people. But Gibson at the end of his life rejected the tradition of, uh, of mind-body dualism and instead developed what, what was an ecological approach and called it direct perception. That we can see the affordance of the world directly without much, if any, intervening processes in the brain processing, so-called information processing. So anyway, we don't need to worry too much about that. So that is an important background that you can look into when you have the desire to. Let's go through some more experiments. Can you see walking through an aperture like a door without testing it? We do it all the time. Animals do it all the time. It's all over the workplace environment. Safety, accidents. Again, I'm reminded this is talk is making contact with the essence of accidents. Why do they happen? Why do people bump into things? Why do they crash and so on? Perhaps they didn't look carefully. Can you see if you can walk through this gap? If you were standing here looking at that scene like in an experiment, you probably would say, yeah, I could probably walk through that. But could you walk through it without rotating your shoulders? Um, probably not. I think I'd have to walk up to that and do that. So that was one, that's the experiment. Let's ask people when they look at doorways of different widths, can they go through it? Here's the data. Small people, and don't ask me exactly the definition of small versus tall, but there's some category of small. I would be a tall person. Tally would be a yeah, medium person. I don't know. You're at a critical threshold. You'd be a small person. So not, nothing, nothing judgmental, just facts. You've got to categorize largish and smallish people. I'm not sure what the boundary was. But when you look at such people, and in fact, um, yeah. So when you look at these people, you see that as the aperture size gets smaller, let's go smaller, as the width of the door gets smaller to the left, you see that the shoulder rotation increases. Okay, so that makes sense. As you shrink the doorway, people more and more rotate their shoulder to get through it. So what's the critical doorway width? The rotation is defined as more motion than normal sway. There's some normal sway when you walk, right? There's normal <laughs> sway when people walk. That's normal sway, isn't it? So there's normal sway when people walk, and rotation is something beyond that. Defined. So normal, normal sway would be around here, around uh, 5 degrees, 10 degrees, something like that. And rotation begins earlier at larger gaps for larger people. <coughs> larger gaps for larger people. Rotation begins later at smaller gaps for smaller people. Makes sense. When we do the trick of scaling, of body scaling, we now make the aperture size, the extrinsic world, relative to the shoulder width. That's the relevant dimension you've got to think about here. Not leg length, right? not relevant. Shoulder width for this question. Then we find a ratio of 1.3. That's the critical point at which people start to rotate their shoulders for both tall and short people. So again, it's another example, like the leg length examples, that shows that body scaling uh, really reveals interesting things about how all people are the same. Okay? Psychologists love individual differences, but ecological psychologists like me love everything to be the same because it emphasizes that there is a lawfulness to the world. 
And science is about finding the laws of nature, the laws of behavior. Really, that, you know, that's, that's science's big dream, is to show the constancy. The con physicists look for constants. Yeah. You talk about the Psychology is complicated <laughs> and complex. Society is complex. Sociology is complex. And you're absolutely right. There's going to be cultural. There's going to be cultural differences. Like I shouldn't be sitting on a table like this because it's happened for hours. That's what I'm talking in a classroom. So I'll stop that. So yeah, there's going to be cultural differences for sure. And what do you do? You've got to do something as an investigator. I call myself a scientific investigator at times. I'm not in the pub. So as a scientific investigator, you, you, hold on, you, you got to, as a scientific investigator, you've got to do what science is trying to do, which is, which is show that there's some order, that there's some similarity between things. But of course there are differences. And um, even the stair climbing study became controversial when people said, well, what about old people? Old people with arthritis or whatever, they're not going to be able to do 0.88, and it's true. So you've got to qualify the, the result with, well, for normal, normal, what's normal? Well, oh, come on. Healthy, normal, human beings, even from the same culture, or sorry, even from different cultures, 0.88 would be, I would bet, pretty good um, discovery. But there are qualifications. Certainly old people then can't go as high, and then it gets, it gets tricky. Yeah, one can get into a big discussion about uh, the boundary conditions on the results from science. Science is trying to find, purportedly sometimes trying to find the single answer. Well, it's not as simple as that, of course. But you can make some progress. And then, for pragmatic reasons, this is useful for, say, the design of the workplace. So ecological psychology is very pragmatic, actually, most pragmatic psychology out there, I would put it to you, because it always tries to make things practical. It's not just about philosophy, it's about then how do you design a better interface, computer interface, as we'll talk about later, or how do you design a chair better. So really, you bring it down to the, the grounding problem. The grounding problem is how do, you, how do you make the ideas compact the world? How do you make your thoughts real? And reality is, is what you see to that extent. So, don't get too hung up on that. Individual differences, of course, are, are, have, have got their role to play and are very important in, in emphasizing. You had a question. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure at the moment if it's very relevant or not, but regarding that culture um, yeah. issue that uh, mentioned, uh, just uh, I studied in Antarctica that uh, most of the, actually, actually uh, very most of the uh, studies in psychology that have been done in the United States um, obviously, in the, um, there are many different ethnic groups in all around the world, culture, different cultures, different countries, even in the United States. But most of the researchers are, um, have been done uh, by the researcher with the psychology student mostly, uh, undergraduate students in APA you know, studies. And uh, they refer it, this, the result of this study, to the whole community and all the world somehow, because it is the origin of the study. And uh, there are not so many uh, people from different countries, different countries involved in that study. Maybe that's why uh, in um, some cases when you work with the clients in different cultures, different countries, you cannot apply practically many of these things to the... Do you think they're laying back this different? Yeah, no. Time? Basically, uh, there are many... I think, I, think, I think what you're saying in the end is, is compatible with what was previously said, that there's going to be differences. And, um, yeah, sure. But if you choose the right experiment, you can show interesting things about the similarities between cultures. For example, if you go into Sam Charlton's driving simulator, you're going to perceive a situation driving too fast in the same way as somebody from Chile. Yeah, there are many basic or, or somebody who... who who is from Brazil. So there are, look, 
I'd like to emphasize and stick to my guns here and say, if there were not similarities between all of you, more than differences, you'd have nothing to say, you'd not have a society. There's got to be more similarities, relevant similarities, than differences. The differences are the interesting wrinkles. If there's not differences, it'd be boring, wouldn't it? But there's got to be more similarities within the species. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to communicate. There would be no society. I mean, the main thing about humans is they're a social animal. And intelligence is a social phenomenon in many ways. But yeah, individual differences, fair enough. But now again, if you look at the similarities between a bunch of small people and a bunch of tall people, when we scale the world to those different people, all those different people, the curves line up. I mean, this is profound. This was considered to be a big insight 20 years ago, and still is for many people. And can the passable gap be perceived? So that was the that was the actual test of people. That was testing them in real. Sorry, this is this is testing them in real doorways. Can they walk through that doorway that exists? And then we do the experiment on can they be perceived? And similar again, similar profiles, and they line up. This is the perception experiment. Now this is interesting. 1.15 is not the previous number of 1.13. Here's the previous number, 1.13. That says that a gap needs to be about a third. 0.3333 is a third, right? So about three tenths bigger than the doorway. So if the doorway is this size, the gap needs to be about a third as much bigger again like that. That's the critical width. If it's any less than this, I will start rotating my shoulders. And I can I not only do that, but but I, I can see that boundary as well. So 1.3 is a, thir a third bigger than the aperture. But the perception experiment is only 15% bigger. The judgment. This is interesting. Now consider what's going on here. Why do you think that when people look at the doorways and make a judgment, uh, yes, I can go through that without rotating. Yes, no, no, I'll start rotating. When people make those perceptual judgments, they underestimate. They will say that the doorway is smaller than when they actually do it in the judgment. But does that make sense to you? Why does that why should that make sense? That should make sense to you. safe. I'll have a buffer. So I'm now going to be more conservative. Where's the slide? The perceived category boundary of 1.15, 15% bigger, is more conservative than the actual boundary of 1.13. So now I'm going to say when I look or think when I look or see, when I look at a gap, I'm going to see that 1.15 bigger than the actual Sorry, 1.15 bigger than the doorway is the boundary because I want to be on the safe side. I want to say, no, I'm not going to go through that without moving. So I'm more conservative. So this is safety. This is the perceptual viewpoint on the origins of safety. Safe situations are situations that don't require stress don't require danger, and safe situations should be seen as safe. They should be perceivable as being safe. So it actually makes sense that the perceptual system, like you say, somebody said, all the time, all the time we're making perceptual judgments on, on the safe side. Can I cross that gap? <laughs> don't tell how it comes to Can I cross that gap? Yes, I can. Right? <laughs> Can I cross that gap? Yes, but I'm not going to. <laughs> I can see it. From a bush, um, I can see that I probably could. I do it all the time with wife and wife goes, ah, no, don't do that. Um, you go hiking. You know, we all do it. We like to test our boundaries. But we can see stuff. We can see the safety boundaries in the world. Where are we? So, here's an 
interesting table from, this is from the chapter on Moodle. I've put Warren's chapter for your indulgence and enjoyment to read. And this is a table from the chapter that talks about these affordances that, that will be on Moodle following this lecture. It might even already be on. It's already on. So this is the last page that compares the architectural and ecological standards of several affordances, opportunities for action in the world, which we'll say more about in a moment. So, with regards to stair height, the optimal, the architectural standard is five to seven inches. The ecological standard, which is 0.26 of leg length, right? This is the efficiency number, about a quarter of your leg length, is actually on the bigger side. The architectural standards have got a low level of a low boundary of five inches, but that's way smaller than optimal. And uh, that, that's for uh, yeah, that's for. How did we come up with inches? So it's that ratio of leg length right, for tall and short people. That must be the average of the. That must be the average of tall and short people of boundary. That's what that must be. You give it a value. With regard to seat height, we haven't talked about seat height yet. We've all got fixed seats here, but there's a there's an ideal size for your seat that you can adjust with an adjustable seat. Again, you can see the difference between uh, the architectural standards that you see in design uh, specifications versus the ecological standard, which is a range depending upon um, the shape of the person. I think that would mean big and small people. Maximum chair height. What's that? Maximum two feet six inches. Okay, that's 24. 24 six. That's 30 inches, maximum height. And the optimal from the ecological perspective, 30 inches. 30 inches. That's 24. That's 30. So it's about, so that's the maximum stair height, um, chair height. So it's about that. So it's about that much higher than that chair. So, passage width differences again. We haven't talked about graspable objects. This is important for, for knobs on doors, door handles, things like that. Um, there's no architectural standard for that, apparently. Just whatever seems to work. But uh, experiments have shown that there's an optimal size for that. So in summary, <coughs> affordances are the relevant perceivable properties of the environment. Or the relevant perceivable properties. And affordance is defined if it's perceivable. So I can see that that's sit onable to this thing. I can sit on this chair. This is climb onable. This is graspable. This pointer is graspable. If you put able, A B L E, on the end of an affordance, this is drinkable, this liquid, and so forth. Uh, so they're about action. Affordance are about action, the possibilities for action in the environment. Now this is important, if they are to be perceived, and affordances must be perceivable if they are an affordance. Uh, it's hidden, it's not an affordance. Um, there must be information about them. This is something we're going to worry about, the information about the affordance. Information is a big topic, it's the fundamental core of affordance theory, of ecological psychology. What is the visual information for driving? Sam Charles's problem, John Veroni's problem. What's the information for driving? What's the information for climbing? And so on. What's the information, auditory information for, uh, for crossing a road if you're blind? So information is structured energy distributions. That's what, I, that's what we mean by information from this perspective. Structured energy, structured light, structured sound, structured muscle deformation, in the case of touch perception, or haptic perception as the field is called. Structured energy distribution, simply put. So by information, I don't mean, in this case, I'm not talking about words, that kind of information. I'm talking about ecological information, the information for action. So what's this information? Where is it? How is it detected? 
Um, small note here for those who want to understand this more deeply. Information detected. Information is not perceived. I don't perceive the optic flow information for driving a car. I perceive the car in front of me is getting closer. I perceive the affordances of the driving environment. I perceive that this gap allows walking through. I don't perceive the information. The information is the structured light or structured sound. Right? But the information is detected by the brain, by the brain body system. Brain body system, not just the brain. So, small pedantic point, but it's important. If you see that distinction, then you understand quite a bit. Information detected. Or as Gibson said, resonated to. Beautiful metaphor. The brain resonates to information. He came up with that metaphor in the 60s. Now all the fancy neuroscientists are talking about the brain's various frequencies of oscillation and how the brain resonates in different ways to the task at hand. So he was a very prescient and foresightful scientist, was old Gibson. The brain resonates to information, but what are perceived are the action possibilities. So what would the information be? We'll do this and then we'll take a break. Can you take a break normally? Yeah, we'll do, it. we'll do a bit more and then take a break for a few minutes. Um, let's consider eye height information. Now some of you might have come across this in perception and sensation courses. If you did, maybe you've forgotten it, or maybe you haven't at all. But eye height information is a body scale kind of vision information that tells you about the world relative to you. It's quite simple. We can see our own height in the environment. Here's two sticks or trees or objects. We can see our own height. Sorry, we can see the height of those objects in the sense of how they, how they are relative to us. By simple virtue of the fact that the horizon cuts objects at our eye height. Imagine you're looking at this scene. The horizon is basically at optical infinity. Here's the horizon way down here. Um, 30 feet from you is basically, um, for a camera, infinity is beyond 30 feet. So the, the, light, the, the, light, the, the rays of light are parallel to the surface the further away an object is. Here's an object. The rays of light are certainly not parallel to the surface of the land. Here's an object, rays of light are becoming more parallel, more parallel. Eventually, the rays of light to the horizon are parallel. If that's the case, the rays of light from the horizon will intersect objects at your eye height. So you can see that this object is a, is a bit higher than your eye height. This object is, is about a quarter bigger than me. Here's the height of me. My eyes are basically at the top of my head. So that's the height of me. And there's an extra quarter of me. So that object is about one and a quarter times me. That object is also about one and a quarter times me. And this object, therefore, is similar to that object in size. And if you don't have a horizon, if you're not at the beach and you don't see a horizon, the real horizon is there, it's implicit, but there's an approximate horizon given by other visual information, or visual cues, some will say, like a texture gradient, which you might have heard of in sensation perception. Texture gradient concept is Gibson's concept. Gibson, 1950, with his work on the Air Force, pilots landing a plane, he came up with the concept of texture gradient. And Gibson goes throughout all of perceptual psychology in his ideas. But a texture gradient here, of equally sized rectangles, which get smaller and smaller, so-called foreshortening in perspective language, um, shows you roughly where the horizon would be. And so again, this is your eye height. So you, again, you can see the world in your own terms. And there's a nice 3D kind of a picture of it. Right? There's the horizon, there's the beach, here's the beach scene. Right? This is the beach scene, there's the real horizon, which is at your eye height. So any object, you can see is a size relative to you. So where is this information that we keep talking about for the perception of the as well? It's in such sources, such as I have information. There's others, but this is one example. Just one example to give you 
of where this body scale of optical information is. It's all around you. That's how you know the safety boundaries of the world. If eye height info is crucial, then changing our eye height, blocks attached to the bottom of shoes, an experiment that done in this, put blocks on your shoes, and that should temporarily change our perception of the world. So now if I'm higher, with blocks like stilts, I should see the world differently. And that's what happens. People temporarily judge, perceive higher stairs to be step onable as possible, and higher seats to sit on them. Until they moved around for a while, for a short time, only a matter of minutes, until they moved around, and then they recalibrate their system. They recalibrate their perceptual system, and the world starts looking normally scaled. But initially, it looks different. There's all sorts of implications here. Video, came, video gaming comes to mind. You go into an immersive environment where the scale of things might be kind of, kind of skewed with, kind of weird. When you come out of that immersive gaming environment, the world is going to look different for a short time. It's a big problem for virtual reality systems and things like that. Uh, so this is Landmark's work in 1987, again, about 20 years ago. And uh, it's an interesting <laughs> issue for some of the species um, when, we, when we change our, our height. There's a, before we take a break, I'll see if this YouTube does work. I don't know if this is real. This is crazy. I found this yesterday. Window security. So what about other animals then? This is an important question because not only, not only do you think there might be differences between humans, but you might think that, oh, this only applies to humans. Well, again, we're looking for the scientific, we're making a scientific investigation of the principles of perception and action. And the principles underlying the awareness of safety situations. So it's, it's interesting to realize that, of course, other animals are similar to us in many ways. We're not that different, I put to you, than from other animals. Do they make perceptual judgments about gaps in the same way as humans? If they do, then we might conclude that the other animals perceive their environment in a fundamentally similar way to us. Again, Gibson's insight is that we perceive the affordances of the world. When I walk along here, when I want to sit down, when I want to talk to this person, we can talk about social affordances. I won't, but there are those who study social psychology and look at social affordances. They try and analyze the social world in terms of what social partners offer me in terms of opportunities. So the concept of affordances is quite general, can be quite general. It's very hard to do social psychology in a good way from the affordance perspective. It requires very deep thinking about what constitutes social interaction. But my point is that the basis of perception is affordances. That's what animals see. Think of a bat. A bat perceives its world through sound, right? Sonar. It emits clicks, high frequency clicks like chirps. They reflect off of objects, come back, and there's an interference pattern, waves interfering. And the information that's detected is the information pattern for the bat, the almost blind bat. But that bat can use that structured energy distribution to perceive the affordances of its, of its environment. It can fly through gaps this, this wide through going vertically really quickly in the dark using sound information. But that information specifies, points to, is about affordances for action. Those are the real objects of perception for the back. The affordances, this is Gibson's point, ecological psychology is about looking at the affordance properties of the world and asking what's information for them. So here's just briefly an example of a, another animal going through a gap. So yeah, it's quite interesting. Perhaps animals see the world similar to us. A dolphin might do sonar as well, but it sees the world in a similar way to us. It's a deep philosophical question. Does it look different to the dolphin or to the bat or to the elephant? 
But one can argue quite reliably that animals see the affordance of the world the same way that we see the affordance of the world. A mouse can see that it can live in this hole. This is a mouse house. This little hole down here that you can't see. A mouse can live in there. Or an elephant can. But affords living for the mouse. In the same way that this cave affords living for me. So animals see affordances in similar ways. Strong argument for that. So uh, frogs actually have been tested, jumping through gaps, and they again will not jump through a gap smaller than about 1.3 because of their head size. So a similarity exists in the terms of these boundaries. Very interesting that the ecological world seems to be divided up into categories that are the same even across species. It's really quite a, an amazing um, proposal. Uh, you should click on this link, which is the Kia bird. And I might skip it now for time reasons. But the Kia is an amazingly clever parrot. You know, it lives down in the South Island. If you go to Fox Place here with a rental car, it'll pull off all the rubber, rubber around your windscreen, as it did to us. Um, and it's not just mischievous and annoying. It's actually exploring the affordance of its world. It's very, very clever. I'm going to show it to you. Can't resist it. I'll show you one minute of the first part of this David Attenborough study of the, uh, the Kia. So we go to about four minutes. The Kia's appetite for mischief seems insatiable. But is that all it is? Or is there more to the Kia's mind than simple curiosity? Just watch this Kia raiding a wheelie bin. It's using its brain as a chess player does to work out a sequence of moves, which logs need to be shifted in what order to allow it to open the bin. And it isn't just clever, it has brawn as well as brains. This isn't a trick the bird was taught. This Kia is a wild creature. It figured out the problem without any human prompting. A perfect opening gambit. Observations of intelligent behavior like this have brought scientists from across the world to test the Kia's abilities in its natural habitat in Mount Cook National Park. are machines, that they're robots, mind-body problem nonsense. By the way, mind is the technical term for the soul. René Descartes, 500 years ago. The mind is just a fancy fancy term for the soul. Originally it was the soul versus machinery. And animals don't have souls, so they must be machines. Animals aren't working reflexes, neither are we. We're mostly anticipating. We're seeing the future. We're using optic flow information about the future in five seconds' time to know that I'm going to hit that wall in four, three, two, one seconds. I can see that. I can see the timing in the optic flow in the information. Information is about the future, largely. Events. Events include the future. Perceptions about events. So it's not about reflexes, and animals are not just reflex machines. So is this a safe affordance, walking up these stairs? This is some designer house in Sweden. And uh, they do things like that. Ikea <laughs> design or something. Uh, this is looking up the stairway. This is actually looking down it. And uh, 
Yeah. You know, would you do that in hiding? Yeah. <laughs> now, I've left this in from a previous uh, um, uh, lecture series I did, but I think it's somewhat relevant because we're now entering a technology environment, very much so. Um, there was always technology. Wooden wheels were a technology. Uh, rubbing sticks together was a kind of technology. Everything's a technology. It's, it's tools, tools for affordances, tools for our use. But now humans are starting to play with these kinds of tools. They're now putting our intelligence, in some sense, into programs, into robots. Like the Pike River coal mine disaster hired this useless Australian robot, which cracked out after about four meters into the mine. What a waste of money and time. I couldn't believe it when I saw that they were going to do this. I mean, there's no way something like this is going to get over rocks and boulders and so on. It's just, it's just bureaucracy, waste of money. But there is technology now being invented that has taken, has paid attention to the problem of the affordance of the world. Intelligence, you see, is not just about thoughts and playing chess very well and so on. Really, intelligence is about perception and action, thinking and action. Action is the key, big over, overlooked property of behavior. And I don't know if you've seen this, you probably haven't, but this is the most impressive robot in the world, Big Dog, um, designed by a company called Boston Dynamics for the military. Now, I don't support the military, but this is a very impressive robot. And look at its skill in navigating its environment. Not unlike an animal. The test of real intelligence and real ability is the ability to avoid accidents. No robot other than this thing can navigate an uncertain environment. No robot other than this thing, and robots like it, can recover from a lack of balance. And you'll see situations where the robot is pushed and recovers. Look at this. Quite unbelievable. <laughs> now there's an incredible computation going on here in terms of accelerometers measuring the acceleration, gyroscopes measuring the, the position of the body. There's an incredibly fast computation going on. In the same way that your brain is incredibly fast, using your vestibular system in your ear for balance, for example. But also vision. We use vision for balance more than you even know. We'll look at that later. But this is quite incredible. And uh, talk about safety. These, these kinds of devices are now being used in scenarios to ensure our safety, such as bomb disposal, mine disasters, etc., etc. So there's a role to be played by future technologies in ensuring our safety. You'd almost think there's somebody in there. It's very lifelike, very human-like. So how uh, many dollars of development in this time? It's, it's only a research prototype. So, so you can imagine a Mars rover in the future having these capabilities. At the moment, they're not going to send something like this to Mars. But ultimately, something like this is, is what will happen. Maybe in 20 years' time, who knows? But still, this is so far from intelligence. This is so far from, from our kind of intelligence in every way that we, we exhibit. There's a lot of motor control intelligence here and skill. But uh, this cannot play chess. This is all it can do, okay? Which is very interesting in its own sense. So you can watch that later. Because if they can carry safety and food and stuff to places that yeah. you can't get. Yeah, no. The trouble is this is so expensive. The There's only one of these or two of these from this company in the world. Um, but eventually, the, you know, as prices come down and skills go up, etc., sure, um, it's the way to go. Uh, you can look at uh, these other robots uh, real quickly. I mean, now this might look like intelligence to you. 
I mean, it's interesting to think about, uh, you know, the, the origins of intelligence. The origins of intelligence, I'm putting to our perception. The origins of intelligence and perceiving safe situations is perception. These robots don't perceive anything. They're just robots. But they've been programmed to be synchronized through Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or whatever, right? They're synchronized, as you'll see, to move together. They give the illusion of perceiving one another. Here's a social psychology scenario, right? If these were real humans, they'd be perceiving each other's movements through peripheral vision. But this is, a, this is an illusion. They're just synchronized. There's no visual coupling here. That's interesting. It's fun. <laughs> and uh, of course, this all started about 10 years ago with uh, Asimo from Honda, the Honda robot, the one that people like to imitate like this. <laughs> but completely programmed in an explicit way. Every movement is from here to here to here is explicitly done. Importantly, Animals and humans aren't like that. Animals and humans walk like this. I'm not moving that. That's just a pendulum. Okay, real walking is falling and catching. Falling and catching. This is a pendulum. And the size of the pendulum determines how fast it moves. That's called passive dynamics. If it's longer, it moves slower. Lower frequency. Basic physics. So all of these robots with fancy schmancy AI devices you see, they're not intelligent, don't be fooled. They're not close to a cockroach even. A lot of work has gone into programming these guys, and fair play to them for that, a lot of effort. But it's nothing really to do with human or animal's intelligence. It's an illusion. Each movement is programmed. So there's also very little um, other than some balance detectors, there's very little information determining this. No information from the world other than some gravity balance devices, um, gyroscopes, that, that help this uh, device stay upright. We use vision, we use optical vision a lot, as you'll see. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, did anybody see Empire Strikes Back long ago when you were about two years old? 1980, 1976, something like that. And this is Big Dog. I mean, it's remarkably similar to science fiction with its uh, gyros and its actuators, etc. All right, back to Aphorosis. Let's do a bit more detail on them. What's good design? What's safe design? What do you see looking at a rock? Well, the cat. The cat sees, how does this work? Oh, the cat sees that the rock can hide the prey. The mouse sees that it can hide and also climb on the rock. The human sees that the rock affords throwing. The rock can be a hammer, used as a toe. The rock can hurt his toe. It affords danger, safety concept. So the affordances of objects, although defined relative to the organism, change depending on the organism. Right? This affords different things for the human and for the cat. But still, it has real properties, real properties for action, real properties for interaction with the organism. So affordance goes back to this, this genius called James Gibson. And in 1979, he wrote this. This is your basic definition. The affordances of the environment are what it offers the animal what it provides or furnishes, either for good or ill. The verb to afford is found in the dictionary, to allow, to afford. But the noun affordance, the thing an affordance, is not in the dictionary. I have made it up. I mean by it something that refers to both the environment and the animal in a way that no existing term does. It implies the complementarity of the animal and the environment. This is the ecological insight, the reciprocity of the animal and the environment. Furthermore, he goes on, 
If a terrestrial surface, a floor, a surface is nearly horizontal instead of slanted, nearly flat instead of convex or concave, and sufficiently extended relative to the size of the animal, and if its substance is rigid relative to the weight of the animal, then the surface, su uh, the surface affords support. A waterbed, if I was looking at a waterbed on the floor, I would probably see that it cannot afford support if I saw it wobbling. There would be information about the wobble. If there was no information about the wobble, I might actually try to walk on it and realize it does not afford support. So there can be learning, there can be the development of awareness of affordances, which is important for safety reasons. To be able to explore a situation, to be able to know whether the Ford's standing on, stepping on, does this ice afford standing on or not? How thick is it? You know, so there is a role we play for learning, which is becoming aware of the affordances by making information available. Information needs to be made available to know about the world. Note that four properties listed, horizontal, flat, extended, rigid, would be physical properties of a surface if they were measured with the scale of the standard units of physics. As an affordance of support for a species of an animal, however, they have to be measured relative to the animal. They're unique for the animal, they're not abstract physical properties. Psychology came from physics. All the famous German physicists who went to the United States after the Second World War, Kurt Kafka, Wolfgang Kohler, they started Gestalt psychology. Gibson, actually, started off with uh, Kurt Kafka in Smith College in the East Coast of the United States in the uh, early 1950s. Gibson's approach evolves from Gestalt psychology. Gestalt psychology, remember, is about the whole is different from the sum of the parts. Different, not more, I said different. That Gestalt perspective was then uh, taken further by Gibson. That's the origin, that's the history of this perspective. So it's got a very strong foundation in Gestalt psychology. But uh, physics, physics really is the origin of psychology, trying to measure things in terms of physical dimensions and how do we, how are we then aware of the intensity of light or the weight of a brick. But you see, the way psychology is evolving now, I remind you, is it's getting more and more ecological, it's getting more and more relational. Talking about embodiment, the embodied mind, you'll see on the bookshelves now. The book's called The Embodied Mind. It's not just about physical abstract properties. Um, early, early work by James Gibson in, in 1938 was perhaps the first work ever to under, try and understand how drivers don't collide. Here is the question of can you see the affordance? He didn't have that concept then. How do you see the safe? Passage of travel. He called it the passage of safe travel. He called it the PSP, the passage of safe travel. So, can driver green green car see the passage of safe drive, passage of safe travel? And he thought in terms of a field analysis, like kind of like a magnetic field. And uh, now this concept, uh, you know, 60, 70 years later. Uh, has evolved into optic flow experiments, the sort of thing that goes on in the driving center here in the psychology department with Sam and John Peroni and so on. This analysis uh, evolved from questions of how do you see safe situations? Can I see that I have to stop here because that car, from this, at this moment, this car is here. But I can see here, I can see that this car is traveling with a certain velocity and it's going to be here. I can anticipate through the laws of optical information, I can see that that car will be there in the future. So I can see that I'm going to have to stop there. Experiments now in the last seven years verify that this is all possible. People can do it, just like the affordance experiments. Can you do it? And now the experiments are really asking what is the optical information? that allows you to see the future. That you can see that that car will be there. That's anticipation. So uh, then along comes a cognitive psychologist called Donald Norman in around 1988. 
1988, he writes a book called The Psychology of Everyday Things. And this is the front cover. And this book became famous. Donald Norman became famous with this book. He was a cognitive psychologist, very interested in industrial. He works in an engineering department, but also is a psychology professor at Stanford. Uh, very famous cognitive psychologist, Norman. And uh, he focused on affordances. He took Gibson's concept and said, oh, here's a great concept. I'm going to make a part on this. Not exactly, but he realized that he, he could do a lot with this wonderful concept of the affordance. And his cover is of a teapot that doesn't really afford much. <laughs> what does it afford? Picking up, balancing on your head, maybe. But it doesn't afford pouring tea. Interesting enough, uh, about 10 years later, he changed the title. Which book would you buy? Well, it seems that the marketeers and marketers thought that changing the title would be better. Don't ask me why. Perhaps people are afraid of the concept of psychology, but design and designers became much more trendy, I think, and uh, changed the title. But the content was the same. So Donald Norman's definition is similar. Uh, he wrote a popular book. Uh, he renamed it. He introduced Gibson's concept to so the information technology and the design community. He wrote, the term affordance refers to the perceived and actual properties of a thing, primarily those fundamental properties that determine just how the thing could possibly be used. A chair affords is for support, and therefore affords sitting. Affordances provide strong clues to the operation of things. Plates are for pushing on a door. Knobs are for turning on a door. Slots are for inserting things into. Balls are for throwing or bouncing. And you can see that when affordances are taken advantage of, the user knows or sees, knows what to do just by looking. Here's the important bit. No picture, label, or instruction needed. This is the key thing about affordance-based design. Things are safer, are they not? Things are more efficient, are they not? If you can see what they're for, if you can use them easily, if you don't have to fiddle. I was looking for the volume control. I can't see it. Ah, annoying. Couldn't turn up the volume for you. They should have a big button there called volume. How am I supposed to do that? It's crazy. Uh, poor design. So good design is efficient, and you can directly perceive what's happening. Yeah, so here's some examples of door handles and other objects. Uh, you look at this on the side of an old computer. What do you want to do? Are you going to pull that? No, it doesn't afford pulling. What about this one? Are you going to pull that? No. Are you going to pull that? Quite possibly. Push, push, push. I don't know what you're going to do with that. <laughs> uh, likewise, probably, are you going to pull or are you going to turn? This is a nice turning affordance. Um, but sometimes affordances are not clear. Glass doors, for example, are. <laughs> <laughs> Sam talks about the handles and the islets. Door handles and okay. Both sides of them have handles on them. Yes, it's confusing. But you don't know whether when you're going out of them, because it's in both directions, if you're going out, you should be able to push them. But it, it looks like you should pull them. With yes. The yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. They're an education block as well, and uh, they annoy me. <laughs> so one worries about the affordances of now icons information technology that you're all going to be dealing with, with your iPads, iPhones, etc. Uh, the question now becomes how easy is it to do things using these virtual affordances? They're not real 3D objects, but they're as good as you have to push that, you have to slide that slider, and so on. You've got to choose a good icon if you're going to design something well. These are big problems for designers now. The problem's been around a long time in terms of uh, fancy engineering equipment. Here's a spaceship, right? It's a space shuttle. Huge number of virtual affordances here that need to be understood. How optimally does one design these things? There is, that could be a computer game, but it's actually from a real display or some kind of a, uh, an aeronautical machine like an aeroplane or a helicopter, I'm not sure what. But the design of these objects for, say, the compass heading or for the speed the, or the altitude, the altitude take, 
the altitude itself. Interestingly here, speed error. This little line, this line is going to move around in some way on top of this, representing your error. So here is a recipe for either a very safe navigation or a recipe for disaster. It could be either safe or unsafe, depending upon how directly perceivable the environment is using these virtual affordances. This is a modern BMW, heads-up display, evolved from the fighter pilots' uh, devices used for killing people in wars, <laughs> aircraft. But now we've got head-up displays in cars. The question is, is this, is this going to be safe? Are these displays going to now occlude, get in the way of the real world out there and hide it? So you've got to be really careful with these uh, new fancy displays. Technologists can do this, but the question will be always, is it the right thing to do? So if you come across usability in your previous courses, usability is a trendy term. You see it now quite a lot. Human-computer interaction, HCR. You would be familiar with that term, perhaps. Human-computer interaction and usability. If something is useful, it has the affordance of usability. Usability is a key term for describing the criteria for good, safe information technology or any design. Anything that you're going to create or work with. It's going to be usable. So designers talk about usability and uh, the affordance of usability. Good interaction, usability. Efficient interaction, safe interaction. All usability traits. There's a video here of Donald Norman who I just referred to. Um, just defining his version of affordances. Affordances. Oh, does anybody know how to do yeah. that? You don't know either? Yeah. It's crazy. No. Okay. There's something that says V on it here, but 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 it's a, it's a it doesn't have a thing to turn. That's that's stupid. <laughs> Thank you. Very clever suggestion. There it is. I'm just. Here we go. Affordances is a technical term, sometimes hard to get. But it's really quite simple. Affordances refers to the properties of an object and the person. It's the relationship between the object and the person and what the person can do with that object. For example, what is this? Peculiar shape, peculiar object. But it has practical affordances. For example, it affords support. It's a chair. See? Very comfortable chair. In fact, as long as it supports me and is about the right size, I could use it um, to stand on. Rolls a bit, but it affords support, affords standing. In fact, it affords lifting. And therefore, throwing, I could throw it at you. And hiding, see? It does not afford the passage of light. Therefore, it makes me invisible, useful to hide against. Lots of affordances um, come with objects that you wouldn't expect. So suppose I had a book. Handy, small, can hold in my hand. Obviously, it affords reading and turning the pages. But other things that you might not have thought about, like scratching, like um, if it's raining, protection against the elements. It's pages. Keep your place, fold down the page. Or um, need to make a note, rip out a page. It affords ripping, affords writing. Many affordances. The value of a well-designed object is when it has such a rich set of affordances that the people who use it can do things with it that the designer never imagined. Good affordance is that people can use it for things the designer never imagined. That's an interesting way to look at it. Has multiple affordances. Another term that you might come across in your future careers is interaction design. Again, coming from the notion of affordances. 
interaction design, designing for interactions. Again, coming out of all this theory on direct perception. Study of how design interface of technology can be used in a safe and efficient way. So now we have to worry about buttons, keyboards. The mouse is kind of going by the way, isn't it? Because now we touch joysticks. Haptic control, haptic means touch. James Gibson is the origin of the term haptic. He rediscovered the old Greek word meaning Greek hapticos. Hapticos means to lay a hold of. 1966, James Gibson book had a whole chapter on haptic perception, touch perception. Now everything talks about haptic controllers in IT. James Gibson. Motion sensing devices. Accelerometers are now on your iPhone to know which way is up on your on your iPhone. Motion capture, the connect, the connect device allows you to play games by knowing where your body is. That's called motion capture. So these are now very interesting computer, human computer interaction technologies that we need to think about. Virtual reality's been around at least 20 years, 30 years really, the 90s. You see it in the Hollywood movies quite a bit. Minority Report has a wonderful example of it with Tom Cruise navigating his way through virtual uh, um, screens using just his gestures. And uh, the point here is that there's issues for safety. There's issues for what sort of information is being presented, and is it being presented in a way that allows you to interact in a good way. Virtual exercise is something that yours truly, about 10 years or more ago, uh, looked at in our laboratory in Australia, where you could put something into an immersive environment. They're immersed in a visual environment, such as a roadway, while walking on a treadmill. And we were exploring the issue of virtual exercise, walking up a hill without actually walking up a hill. You see the hill, and seeing a hill influences the way your body works. Visual information is extremely compelling. Here is an interesting piece of research from two years ago only on the concept of embodiment. What the way we see the world depends, the way we think about the world depends upon how we see it. So this experiment compared seeing your own legs while lying down versus seeing a doll's legs while laying down. The real legs are touched. Here you, here you are lying down with goggles on, virtual reality goggles. What you're seeing is actually this video camera looking at this doll. All right? The doll is smaller than your body. If you see your own legs while being touched, everything is in correlation. You, you're touched on the leg, you feel it, everything seems normal. But now you see the doll's legs, which are smaller, being touched. You actually get a very vivid impression that these are your legs when you're an experimental subject. And because your body is smaller, it changes the way you see the world. So they then do a size perception test and a distance perception test. Your size perception changes after you've experienced this scene. When your test is on the side of this object, it looks bigger. Your judgments overestimate how big this really is. When you see this scene of the doll's legs being touched and do a distance perception, this looks further. They test people how far they think that is and they overestimate. So tiny bodies perceive the world as huge. Children, when you were a child, the world looked huge to you. It was huge to you. And it seemed much huger than it really was. This can be pulled out of your head. That's right, there would be adjustments here as well. Can you adjust? There, um, there, there would be, if, if this went on for a long time and then we were tested and then saw that and then tested, eventually you would recalibrate. The famous experiments from the 50s on upside down goggles, those people wore the upside down goggles for a week and the world initially was upside down, they couldn't coordinate at all, but after a week they were riding a bicycle. So, they, so people adapt to visual information, provided they can act, provided they can calibrate by moving. In this situation, they're not moving, so I don't know, I don't know if they tested recalibration here. Um, maybe if you read the paper, um, you can find that out. 
So virtual reality now we've got augmented reality. This is now what you have in your mobile phone and your iPads. This is like virtual reality, but cheaper and more readily available. Uh, this is where now your device can provide extra information about the world. So those other ones in your own time. The parody is very funny. Um, and the one I want to show you is this. So, it works. Right, so you've got navigation systems in your car. Well, that's fine and well to have a navigation system, but the danger, here's a safety issue in the design of affordances, the danger is using the technology in inappropriate ways. You all know about mobile phones and distraction. You've got a center here with Sam who vigorously investigates it. I've done some of the research myself in Australia on mobile phones and driving in real cars. We did the world's first study of it in real cars. So I have a very vested interest 
in this kind of technology and the potential danger of it. Clearly, this is not a good idea. The technology allows you to do this, superimposing information on the world, but in something like car driving, so there's issues about the technology now available that we've got to be somewhat careful about. So well, I'll fly through this quickly till I get to the end. This is just saying that motion information is fundamental to seeing the world. Motion information. If there's no motion, you do not see stuff. Gives an insight. The occluding edge. Occlusion was a big topic for James Gibson to try and understand occlusion. Without occlusion, you do not see objects. The information about a line is not a line. The information about a line is a relation. The information about a thing is not a thing. The information for an edge is not an edge. This was Gibson's big insight. The information is revealed in motion. He called it invariance of motion. Something invariant. So, optic flow, driving information, uh, critical for safety in the driving world. Self motion. Uh, the kitten carousel, the kittens raised in the dark, one could move, the other could not. It was carried around in the carousel, right? Passively. The one that can move developed normal depth perception. The one that could not move while being uh, raised in, in, in an environment closed environments did not develop perception. So motion and movement, being able to move one's own limbs is critical for, for understanding the world. Uh, hands up who knows what Gibson's visual fit. You've probably done that. Great. Because the visual fit shows importantly how danger can be directly seen, even by newborn goats, even by mice, animals, so there's information about danger, the affordance. The affordance here is a falling off place. It's a hard surface to remind, this is glass, but the baby and the animal will not go over the glass because they can see and afford danger. No learning required. Some of, this, some of this information is immediate. Direct perception of affordances for danger. Famous, this is the wife of James Gibson, Eleanor Gibson, got the Nobel Prize for Science from President Bush. And so, perception of meaning is about the perception of affordances. So, to sum up, information detected affords perceived. If information is about the environment, perception is specific to information, then perception can be about the environment. That's direct perception. If information is about the environment, and our perception is with regards to information, specific to it, lawfully specific to it, then our perception can be about the environment. Perception, action, cycle. Perception is about information. Information constrains action. Action reveals more information. Information constrains perception. All under attention. That's what we're about. In the moving room, hands up who has seen the moving room in another class. Not too many, but this is a this again shows the importance of visual information for our balance, for the safety of our, our well-being of balance. Again, evolving from Gibsonian work and optic flow. I'll, I'll show you this uh, video and then I think we're done. I'll show, if you haven't seen the video, then it's really worth seeing. So this is a, a fake room. The walls move. And it shows how a youngster's balance is dependent upon and visual information. This visual information in maintaining balance. In most adults, even when doing a difficult task, the sway is small and balance is easily maintained. But if visual information is important, then it should be possible to upset a subject's balance in an experimental room by moving the room gently forwards or backwards. Infants learning to stand are less stable than the adult, and far more easily put off balance. The infant in this experiment has only been walking for a month. When we move the room backwards, the child falls. <laughs> and again. In 92 trials of this type, seven infants, balance was clearly disturbed in the prediction
predicted direction in 82% of the trials. It seems then that for the infant learning to maintain balance, visual information is far more potent than mechanical information. Well, this is really important. These experiments show beautifully the importance of optical information for your balance, even more important than the vestibular sense, more important than the inner ear, even. And this applies to all animals. You know your orientation from the visual optical information. So, what is safety? Safety is all about having sufficient information available in a workplace environment, designing so that things can be directly seen, directly perceivable without too much trouble. And it's no longer just I think, therefore I am, it's I perceive, therefore I am. I am is information, awareness, and meaning. Information of the environment, awareness of affordances, gives you the meaning of the world of affordances. If you don't have information, bad news. Glass door situation. <laughs> no information in the glass door unless there's a handle can lead to disaster. You need information. If there's no awareness, classic situation you've heard about with mobile phones. There's no meaning, it's more like I am not rather than I am. So, workplace safety, I hope you have a good career designing situations where it is maximized, where it's efficient, and you're kept safe. That's it. <laughs> <laughs>